And I don't think he's going to throw the ball as much as he thinks he's going to throw the ball now that Chip Kelly's on board. And I'm happy about that. More quarterback. Um, the truth is, Ryan Day has made a change philosophically. But it's none of those. You all know who wins. LSU is the drunkest fan base in the country. Start. That means we got and welcome to Juck on Bucks on a Friday, our last episode from Juck on Bucks Studios, Southeast in Big 12 country, Orlando, Florida, home of the UCF Knights. And uh, I would not mind going to see a Knights game, though. I don't know why. I didn't even check and see if they were in town this week. I should have done that. But uh, last, uh, last episode down here, and I can't wait. It took me, I'm not kidding you guys, eight hours, eight hours for yesterday's episode to upload so that you could watch it. And uh, it was even an hour late. Incredibly embarrassed. I apologize for that. Also a little embarrassed that uh, somebody pointed out, um, this is why I love Juck. And he had a timestamp. It said like 417 or something. So I'm like, what did I say at 417? And I go and look. And uh, apparently I, I was setting up um, entering a clip, right? Like if you haven't seen it, here it is. Totally forgot to splice the clip in so you know uh <laughs> embarrassing stuff embarrassing stuff but when you've had the week i had with this kind of uh, equipment and the in the bandwidth and such you would understand but anyway at least uh at least my screw-ups are somewhat endearing to some people sorry guys but today we're going to go over our weekend slate of picks the best games of the weekend but first we're going to talk about nebraska as the buckeyes take on the huskers in game number three of the four-game stretch that we said is going to define the regular season. Obviously, you won the first against Iowa, lost the second in a heartbreaker out in Eugene. You got Nebraska, and then the really big one against Penn State. Now, as we all know, college football, you got a different team every week. These are young dudes, and the best teams are the most consistent good teams. Nebraska Absolutely destroyed last week against Indiana. I suspect the Buckeyes are going to see a different version of the Huskers. It's obviously stolen some juice from this game. We thought that they were going to come in with potentially, well, potentially undefeated a while back. And then after the Illinois loss, just by a couple of points, six and one. We certainly didn't think Indiana would beat them back then when they lost to Illinois. But now they've lost two games, one of them an absolute demolition from Indiana, but we now know that Indiana is the absolute real deal, right? But after a loss like that, you expect a team that's coached well to make a whole lot of changes, and I think we'll see a much better Nebraska team in Columbus than we saw in Bloomington. At least they're hoping so. Nebraska, of course, led by Dylan Rayola, freshman phenom quarterback, one-time Buckeye commit, one-time Georgia commit, one-time student at four different high schools, averaging 225 passing yards a game, just a 66% completion percentage, and now on the season, nine touchdowns, six interceptions. Started off the year pretty good. The last three games, not so hot. Offensive coordinator Marcus Satterfield has been the target of a lot of ire from, uh, from the Husker faithful this week, as he had a bit of an embarrassing clip floating around from his press conference. Marcus, as a play caller, what's that target number for yards per play that you would aim for? That's within reason. Mm, that's, that's a good play. Or that's a, uh, between four and six. I don't know what that – I honestly don't even know what leads the country in yards per play. What, what, would, be a, what would be a top yards per play? You guys are at five and a half right now. Um, that's why I asked. Yeah, that's no a great question. Questions. You stopped me. I don't want to lie to you. I don't know what's leading the country, but I want it to be a little bit more than what it is now for sure. I can't see this dude being back next year. He might not make it through the rest of this year. And when I see a coach who I respect, and then I see, this isn't going to sound nice, but a bozo like that in the coach's employ, it kind of shakes me to my core because I thought that I knew Matt Rule. And I feel like I could talk to that guy, that Satterfield fella, and in five minutes understand that he's not on the level. So disappointed in Matt Rule, maybe he's not the guy I thought he was. But Dylan Rayola, three picks last week. How do you beat this kid? Obviously, as a freshman, you beat him with pressure. He can't deal with it yet. It's one of the biggest reasons that you don't want a freshman to play right away. He also can't move as well as he could back in his junior year of high school when we all first started watching his film. 
And, uh, you know, he's put on a couple of pounds and it's got to be tough for him because the kids clearly got the gene. Dad and uncle were an offensive, were offensive linemen. Um, and as someone with the gene, I know what I'm talking about. It's both a blessing and a curse. You can gain muscle really easy, but it's tough to keep that fat down as well. He's a big boy and uh, he's tipping the scales pretty heavy right now. Not moving so hot. Obviously, he makes some really impressive throws, kind of like uh, the, the touch that he can make throws with sometimes. It's just really impressive. The off-platform stuff, which sometimes I think he relies on a little too much. Sometimes I think he does it when it's not necessary because he thinks it looks cool. And he does a lot of things because I think it looks because he thinks it looks cool. And it does. He looks pretty cool. Uh, you know, the Mahomes stuff I've talked about before, it's just a little over the top. All in all, though, I think the dude's going to be a really good quarterback, but he's not ready for what's coming for him this Saturday as the Buckeyes seem revved up and ready to uh, get some pressure at all costs, which he's not going to deal with. Nebraska's got a really good wide receiver in Isaiah Nair. The dude's a stud. He can definitely beat some people deep, and he can make some big plays. But just 19 receptions on the year. He started off pretty hot. That slowed down as Rayola slowed down. Last week, the Huskers had five turnovers, and that was one of the biggest reasons for the huge blowout. The other is Indiana's just really that good. Nebraska not running the ball that well. Despite having a couple of really good running backs, they didn't rush for 100 yards against Indiana, Rutgers, or Illinois. How are they going to run against Ohio State? I don't think they are. They also abandoned the run quickly when it's not working. Marcus Satterfield said that they got to stick with it. He's going to try to stick with it. Tough to do that when you get down early. The only shot the Huskers have at beating the Buckeyes is mucking this thing up. Old, nasty, ugly Iowa football. uh, Keeping the ball out of Ohio State hands, holding on to the ball for a long time, and trying to catch an explosive play here or there. The Nebraska defense has given up just 17.7 points a game. That's good for top 20 in the country. So that's pretty good. And they do got some big old boys up front that I do think are definitely going to give the interior of the Buckeyes offensive line some fits. So what I like to do every Friday before the game is put together 10 questions, 10 questions. And then based on what we see in the game, we come back in the post game show and we answer those questions. So what are the 10 questions? Um, And by the way, as far as the post game show guy, uh, guys, I'm going to be able to watch the first half of the game, maybe somewhat into the third quarter. Then I've got to fly. Then I've got to get home. Then watch the rest of the game. So the post-game show, obviously not going to be immediately after the game this week. We're either going to go late at night or Sunday morning. Uh, we'll decide. We'll see how, uh, how fast I can get unpacked, get my equipment back set up at home because I did bring everything, though I probably didn't need to. I would have probably been better just recording all this off my iPad because uh, it's just been a nightmare and a disaster. But, you know, here we are. You live and learn. Anyway, our 10 questions. Number one, and we always start with this one. Will the Buckeyes get off to a fast start? It's been a problem for years. We've now had three games this year that I would consider that they got off to a good start, a good quick start, um, which is definitely better than last year. So all in all, I'm pretty happy about it. But always target number one, can they get off to a good possession on offense and a good possession on defense to set the tone? Number two, Zen Mikulski, the backup left tackle. Obviously, this is a key to the rest of the season, maybe the biggest key for the rest of the season, the one position that you didn't really have depth you were comfortable with. You lose Josh Simmons. How's Zen going to do? They're going to be coming for him, no doubt about it. And we know that Penn State is definitely going to be coming for him. So how's he going to hold up? A great relationship with Donovan Jackson right next to him. And uh, I'm really excited to see how he does. I'm certainly rooting for him. I think he's a great kid. He's got the size. Folks call him athletic. I've not personally seen that myself. I think we'll all get a good gauge after this game. And I'm excited, man. Excited for Zen. Number two, at right guard. Tegra's got a hell of a matchup. Nebraska got some studs inside. And remember, if you forgot, Tegra also got injured during the Oregon game. I think it kind of got overshadowed. But Tegra was injured early in the Oregon game. Austin Saraveld came in. Austin wasn't playing too good. And then Tegra came back in. 
Are we done seeing the rotation between Tegra and Austin? Will we see some more of that? Remember that Oregon game was going to be the first game that Tegra was just going to get all the snaps. And we didn't see that because of injury. I think it's going to be all Tegra all the way. But, you know, until we see a full game of that, you know, yet to be seen. Um, so that's question number two. Number three, the tight end, uh, Will Kazmarek, injured, broken collarbone, I believe. Who's going to get his snaps? Probably Bennett Christian. Do we also see about 20 snaps out of Jelani? Or do G and Bennett Christian eat up all those snaps and Jelani gets the five he's been getting the last couple of games? Do you even care anymore? Are we done talking about Jelani this year? Are we ready to move on and say he's on the shelf till next year? We're done with the conversation. I don't know where you guys stand on it. Uh, I would still like to see him repping and trying to improve. But if he's not cutting it during the week of practice, then, you know, it is what it is, man. Number four, Quinshawn. Does he play? If so, how much? Number five, James Peoples. Do we see James Peoples? I love Jimmy the Peoples, and I want to see him in a game that means something. I think this would be a hell of a first test, some really good competition, a tough Big Ten defense, and I sure hope that we do get to see some of the Jimmy the Peoples. And uh, excited for that one. I think we will. Number six, Carnell Tate. The emergence of J.J., you know, Obviously, J.J.'s what he is. And I thought that this year we were going to be able to see Carnell kind of break out. And I think we have to a certain extent. He's certainly shown what a great blocker he is, what a great team player he is. And I definitely would like to see him maybe, I don't know, I'd like to see them maybe make a conscious effort to get him involved. Um J.J. now, 11 Warriors just had their top 20 this week. They got J.J. as the number one player on the team. I think that I would say J.J. is the number one player on the team. Would you? I think most of us would say that at this point, which is just insane that a freshman wide receiver is probably the best player on the football team. I mean, it's amazing. And uh, as far as Tate goes, that's got to suck. We didn't see It's got to be awesome, but it's also got to suck. We didn't see him get involved in the Oregon game to way at the end and he made a clutch play and that was great to see but I would certainly like to see him maybe get a little more action so I'm looking out for that as so far this year just 15 receptions halfway through the season 230 yards and just one touchdown I'm sure he was hoping for more and based on everything he's done in the run game blocking downfield in the past game I would definitely like to see him you know in a game like this where you're probably going to get up a little bit early a conscious effort to get him some balls. I'd definitely like to see it for him. I think we're going to, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they make that attempt to get him more involved just as you're moving forward to keep him engaged. You know, these are things you got to think about. Number seven, let's move to the defensive side of the ball. Do we see some new concepts, some new techniques from the defensive ends, basic stuff, exotic stuff? I don't know. We got no idea. Our hope is, we see some more aggressiveness in one way or the other when it comes to that. Do they let it loose against Nebraska? Or do they hold most of, off, you know, most of what they're going to do off for Penn State? Do you want to practice some new things against Nebraska or keep it in disguise for Penn State? I don't know. It'll be interesting to see, and it's probably you know, the biggest question when it comes to the defense. Number eight, the linebackers. I thought Sonny and Cody played really solid against Oregon. That was two solid games in a row. I think, was that three solid games in a row from Sonny, which was great? No. Iowa, he played really good, but that was in the 4-3 playing Sam. And then you had Oregon. So two really good games in a row from Sonny, I think. Uh, pleasantly surprised with him against Oregon. Great news. Great news for him. Great news for the defense. Now, Nebraska runs a lot of 11 personnel, which means we're going to see plenty of 4-3, which means we're going to see a lot of Arvell. Arvell doesn't play great for whatever reason in the 4-3. He's played better in the 4-2. Um, Sonny, the opposite, which is just wild. But I want to see more Arvell. I don't know if we're going to see more Arvell when they drop down to the regular base defense. But I certainly would like to see some more Arvell on that as well. 
Um, the good news is he's going to get more than the four snaps he got against Oregon where he came in, didn't play well. Uh, but when you only get four snaps, you make one bad play and you didn't play well. You know what I mean? If he would have played 10, maybe he would only had one bad snap. It's tough to really judge anybody off of four snaps. But I would certainly like to see uh, some more Arvell. So I'm kind of looking forward to that 4-3 this week. So what do we see out of the linebackers? Do we see good play from Sonny again? That would be an excellent sign. Cody, obviously, he had the one big missed tackle. But other than that, I thought he was pretty solid. And do we see some more Arvell? Um, could Gabe Powers maybe start getting in the mix in the second half of the season? I would definitely like to see that as well. I'd like to see him get a shot. We've seen a lot of C.J. Hicks getting a shot. i definitely like to see Gabe out there in some meaningful time as well. Number nine, uh, Lathan Ransom. Now we know Ryan Day confirmed it in his Wednesday evening, uh, what do they call it, lightning round press conference after practice, that Lathan definitely is hurt. So what do we see in his place? Do we see Jordan Hancock move back to safety? Jermaine Matthews or... or uh, Low Styles come in at nickel. We know that Jermaine was repping there for a couple weeks in the preseason. I don't think he's a great fit physically for uh, kind of filling in in the, the linebacker style tackles that we see Hancock make up towards the line of scrimmage. Lorenzo Styles may be a little more fit for that. Do they split both of them up? Or do we see a guy like Jalen McClain, who I absolutely love, uh, or Malik Hartford, but, you know, Jalen McClain... A younger dude, but man, he's just, uh, he's a bad dude. I think there's a little something there to him. I think there's a little something there to, the, to him. A kid who was uh, undervalued uh, on the recruiting trail, and I think they might have really nailed it with this dude. He's got some serious juice. He might be something moving forward. He might be a very, very pleasant surprise, and I would certainly like to see him get a shot if they choose to go that direction and not scramble everything around, i.e. moving Lathan out of position, but just bringing Malik or him straight in, I would definitely like to see some of McLean in that situation. But those are our 10 questions along with the final score prediction. Will I get it right or will I be way off? We're going to go with Buckeyes 42, Huskers 14. So to reiterate, fast start, Zen, Tegra, tight end, Quinshawn, James Peoples, Carnell Tate, the pressure package, the linebackers, the safety, and the final score. And we will go over these answers in our post-game show along with all of your comments because we pull it up and, uh, and just juck around. You know what I'm saying? That's how we do it in the post-game show. Everybody gets their voice heard. You guys lead the show, um, and it's going to be a whole lot of fun. So whenever that is, please do subscribe. Set your alarm bell. And we will definitely uh, have a good time in the post-game show, whether that be Saturday night or Sunday morning. Um, and that's that with that. All right. I always like to go over the previous week's highest rated games, top 10 games to kind of gauge the pulse of what the average fan is watching. No, they're not casuals. They're not the casual fan. We're the psychos. They're just average. They're the average fan. We're the insane people, the junkies, and this doesn't apply to us. So, what did they watch the most? Georgia and Texas, of course, was the number one game of the week. Also, the number one game of the year now, with 13.2 million viewers, which barely edged out Alabama and Georgia, which barely edged out Ohio State and Oregon, which sucks. I thought the Buckeyes and the Ducks were going to take the number one spot. Kind of a bummer. If you look at the peak numbers... They were pretty much all three dead even. But, you know, you got to go by this. And uh, they take the top spot. Anyway, the second biggest game of the week was, of course, the other big-time SEC game. Alabama at Tennessee in Neyland. And uh, it was a slop fest. 10.2 million people watched that. The third game of the week really surprised me as Miami, heading to Louisville, was the number three with four million people watching that game which was more than Indiana, Nebraska, and more than Michigan, Illinois. Immediately, I thought, how could they want to watch that over Indiana, Nebraska, or Michigan, Illinois? And, you know, then I realized this is probably me just really wanting to see that Indiana, Nebraska game and really wanting to 
watch Michigan, Illinois to watch Michigan lose because I was really into those two games. Both of those were $3 million. Again, $4 million for Miami at Louisville. Number six, Auburn at Missouri, $2.5 million. Then at number seven, Friday night's game, Oregon at Purdue, Oregon 35 to nothing. Below Friday night's game, you had Colorado at Arizona, which was a pretty exciting game, I thought, heading into it, by the way. Uh, Colorado whopped them. Two million people watched that, which makes you think that for most of those really non-football fans that have been paying attention to Colorado the last year and a half, maybe they're kind of, I don't know, not so interested, which is odd because Colorado's actually now finally starting to play pretty good football. But they never cared about the football anyway. That game did, however, beat Notre Dame and Georgia Tech, which is pretty wild. Notre Dame usually gets a pretty big number just based on their following. Bringing up the rear of our 10-pack, Iowa and Michigan State. All right, let's go on to this week's slate of games. And I like to go by viewing slot because this is how we consume the games. Last week, our picks were six and three. And I'm going to go over our picks plus my personal rooting interest. We are plus 11 units on the season. And I, these are all one unit games. Uh, we place all our action for these games at my bookie, where if you sign up now and use the promo code JUCK, they're going to match your deposit 100% up to a thousand bucks. So if you put in a hundred, you're going to get to play with 200, put in 500, you'll play with a thousand. And it is, uh, you know, an excellent book that has everything you need. Also, you're going to get a $10 free casino chip to check out their online casino, all with the promo code Juck. And, uh, we're about to go over these plays. If you were playing them all, you'd be up plus 11 units. So let's rock and roll my bookie promo code Juck. Here we go with tonight's plays. And we're going to start with Friday's game. Uh, actually, we got two games on Friday night that are of interest to me, both of them late, unfortunately, if uh, if you're on the East Coast, which most of you are 1030. We've got Boise State at UNLV, and that game is for first place in the Mountain West Conference UNLV, which just that one heartbreaking loss at Syracuse in overtime with that garbage roughing the passer call on Kyle McCord. You remember that one uh, Boise State with that one heartbreaking loss out at Eugene, Oregon as it took Oregon a punt return and a kickoff return to win that game. The line is Boise, minus three and a half. I'm going to go with UNLV here, but I'm rooting for Boise. And I'm rooting for Boise because I'm rooting for Travis Genty to win the Heisman. Now, UNLV is not going to shut Genty down, but uh, they'll not be shut down themselves. The number here, 64 and a half. This should be a fun one. If you like points, stay up and watch this guy. Our second game, going to be on Fox. And that is Rutgers out at USC. USC, a 13 and a half point favorite. Rutgers squeaked out a game against Washington a couple of weeks ago, and then they got their doors blown off against Wisconsin. Now they head out to USC. I like USC to cover this 13 and a half and Lincoln to finally get his second Big Ten win more than halfway through the season. Congrats, Lincoln. Definitely, I'll be rooting for Rutgers. I love Greg Schiano's team, I like the way he goes about his business. Uh, and I hate USC, but I do have USC minus the 13 and a half here. Now, on to Saturday, and we're going to start with our 12 o'clock slot. I guess the headliner in the 12 o'clock slot, you got two ranked teams in number 12, Notre Dame, at number 24, Navy. Notre Dame, a 13 and a half point favorite. Navy undefeated, and that's awesome. But Notre Dame plays these academies well enough to know how to defend them. And on the flip side, Navy just doesn't have the guys to hang with the Notre Dame wide receivers and the skill Notre Dame's got the playoffs dangling out in front of them. I look for a similar game to when Notre Dame went up to Purdue. I think this is going to be an absolute disaster of a game for Navy. And that's unfortunate because I always root for our service academies, but I've got Notre Dame minus the 13 and a half. Also in the noon slot, we have the Ohio state Buckeyes hosting the Nebraska Cornhuskers. The Buckeyes now up to a 25 and a half point favorite. My rooting interest here is the Ohio State Buckeyes because I like them. I'll also be taking them to cover 25 and a half. But I don't bet on the Buckeyes. That's just for fun. Also in the noontime slot, we've got a chance to watch Indiana again if you can stomach it on the Big Ten Network. They host Washington. And the line, just Indiana minus six and a half, which is kind of surprising, even though Indiana has their backup quarterback. He did come in against Nebraska and throw two touchdowns, looked really crisp. This is a guy who's 
played games last year. He's won games. And uh, I like them definitely to cover this six and a half points. This is a really big game. The six and a half line kind of tells it all. We actually really want Indiana to win because we want Indiana to come into Ohio State with just that one loss uh, or, or with no losses. So Ohio State can give them just that one loss. Um, that would be pretty fun. We want them to be ranked as high as they can. Um, and again, they're playing with their backup quarterback. So this is going to be a pretty interesting one. For 21 Missouri heads into Tuscaloosa to take on number 15 Alabama. And the general public has given us a doozy here. Alabama opened up as a 13 and a half point favorite in the general public like they often do with a brand name team like Alabama. They know Alabama just lost. They see that 13 and a half point line and they say, ooh, Alabama's going to be pissed off. They're going to go in there and they're going to kill somebody after that loss. And that's just not the way this works. You and I know who this Alabama team is. It's a pretty flawed team. It's a pretty undisciplined team. And yes, they're going to beat Missouri. This isn't a very good Missouri team. We saw Texas A&M absolutely destroy them, but they're not going to beat them by more points than Vegas thinks they're going to beat them by because they're pissed off. That's not how it works. Um, I think Missouri is going to get in this number. Whether they do or not, the smart play is Missouri here. We'll take them. We're also going to root for Missouri because we like Coach Drink. We usually root for Missouri in the SEC because they've never really felt full-on SEC. Uh, and we usually root against Alabama under any circumstance. However, I do want to shout out the Alabama fans who've hung around this show since I started. They're really cool. And for some reason, Alabama fans pretty interested in, uh, in Ohio State shows. We've got uh, in, the, in the demographics that they show, and they do a really amazing job in, in the YouTube demographics and, and seeing what cities watch the shows. But Detroit, outside of Ohio, is number one. Then you got Portland and Eugene. Then you've got um, Montgomery, Birmingham, uh, Tuscaloosa, uh, even that little town that Malik Autry's from, Apalika, Alabama, uh, and then a bunch of Texas towns around Austin. So you've got Michigan fans, Oregon fans, Alabama fans, Texas fans. I'm assuming most other Ohio State shows probably have a similar kind of breakdown, but that's who's watching Buckeye Media. I apologize if you keep seeing these transitions. Um, the truth is, if I record 10 minutes and hit stop on this little photo booth app, it just won't, it, it erases. It's a gray box when I'm done. Like, can't even record on photo booth. Like, what, what's going on in this place? I, I don't understand. Anyway, let's get to our next game. We've got Vanderbilt, number 25, hosting number five, Texas. Vanderbilt with the opportunity to beat at home Alabama and Texas in the same year. Probably not going to happen, but they are 18 and a half point favorites. And if you're going to keep giving me all these points with Vanderbilt, I'm going to keep making money with them. I'm taking Vanderbilt. Now, on to the seven o'clock time slot, and we've got five games of interest in this slot headlined by LSU and Texas A&M. LSU and Texas A&M both lost game one, LSU to USC, Texas A&M to Notre Dame, both in close losses. And since then, have been lights out. They're both number one in the SEC, undefeated in the SEC, just that one loss on the season. This game is a pick 'em, opened up at Texas A&M minus two and a half. I like Texas A&M here. Um, I like Texas A&M as a rooting interest as well. I, under normal circumstances, I would root for LSU because I think that the program is unique in college football. And I think that's what makes college football really cool. Unique programs like LSU. But I can't root for Brian Kelly in any situation. Brian Kelly in year three, Mike Elko in year one, both seem to have their programs really on the right path here. I think the difference here is going to be the Texas A&M defense and the 12th man at Kyle Field. And those, those cool yell leaders in the white suits at Texas A&M. Like those guys make all the difference in the world. So we're going to go Texas A&M in the pick'em here. Rivalry game, Michigan, Michigan State, two rivalry games coming up here. Uh, Michigan is a five-point favorite at home against Michigan State. And I don't know if I got a blind spot here when it comes to Michigan. I probably do. But I think Michigan State is a pretty darn solid team. If they were playing on a neutral field, I'd make Michigan State the favorite. Michigan being a five-point favorite, I just don't get. I, I really don't. 
All Sparty has to do is score 14 points and they win this game. I don't trust Sharon Moore to do anything right. He's talking about potentially switching the quarterback again. Like, no, <laughs> give me Sparty. Go green, go white. All right, another rivalry game as Kansas State hosts Kansas. And this line has got us begging to go one way. So we're going to go the other way, of course. Kansas State, ranked number 16 in the country. They are 6-1. and one. Kansas has won just two games on the year. They've been pretty dreadful. You've got a battle with two of the best coaches in college football, in my opinion, in Kansas State's Chris Kleiman. Kansas is Lance Leopold, who was the Kurt Signetti before Kurt Signetti, just not quite as good. He resurrect, resurrected, he, he, he wrecked Kansas. <laughs> he wrecked Kansas, and, uh, and they paid him $7 bucks a year to stay. He's also an older guy, like Signetti, older. I mean, 63. Well, Signetti's 63. I don't know how old Leipold is, but he's similar age. And he's going to stay at Kansas, an awesome coach. They've had a bad year, no doubt. Kansas State has had a really good year. And uh, they're cooking with gas. They got a lot of talent. Avery Johnson's a stud. They're only a 10-point favorite at home. And this line is just begging me to take Kansas State, which means bet the house on Kansas. That's what it means, guys. There we go. And on to the big-time game, which is on Peacock, and none of us are going to watch it, as Penn State heads up to Camp Randall, to take on some nighttime voodoo up at Camp Randall. I don't know what Penn State is. They came out and beat West Virginia really big. We thought that was a really good win. Eh, West Virginia's so-so. They go out to SC. People were talking about, is this a big win for James Franklin? SC's 1-4 and in the Big Ten. Nope, wasn't a big win for Franklin. And it went to overtime. And Penn State could only throw to their tight end. Uh... This is not a team that's very good. I, 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 don't, I just don't think it is. They're not even that great defensively. But they're number three in the country. And I would like them to come into that Ohio State game undefeated and in the top three. But uh, I would also like to see Wisconsin upset them. What would I like more? Well, based on the fact that it doesn't really matter if they're top three anymore. Sure, I want, like, as far as BCS rankings and playoff rankings, Ohio State's got to beat them regardless. And it doesn't help them any more or less if they're in the top 10 or in the top three, in my opinion, when it comes to uh, playoff selection time, the Buckeyes just got to go ahead and win the rest of their games. They can lose one in the Big Ten championship, and they're still in regardless of what Penn State comes in. Now, it would be more fun if they were ranked higher, but I think I'd have just as much fun watching Wisconsin beat them at Camp Randall. I'm rooting for Fick, man. You know, I I just I got to root for Fick. Penn State, a six and a half point favorite here. Wisconsin started off not so hot. The Wisconsin faithful wondering if Fickle was the right choice. Well, he started to pick it up when he went into Wisconsin, went into Rutgers as an underdog, beat them straight up, beat the crap out of them. 41 to nine in the Juck on Bucks upset pick of the week a couple weekends ago, and then beat UCLA 21 to three or something. Um, UCLA there in LA with USC. Um, And now Wisconsin a huge game, the biggest of the year so far, for sure, for them. Is it bigger than Bama? Yeah. I mean, geez. They got to host Bama when Bama early on in the season, and now they get to host top top uh, three Penn State, man. They've had a hell of a home slate. Pretty cool for the Badger fans. Uh, so definitely rooting for them. Penn State is minus six and a half. I'm going to take Wisconsin plus the six and a half. Uh, I'm just not a believer in this Penn State team. I'm just not. The defense is is. They can get after you, for sure. I like the way Wisconsin is is starting to lean more on the run game. Phil Longo was always a weird hire. Losing Tyler Van Dyke might have been a blessing in disguise for them because they've started to pivot off of how they're going about things on offense. So we'll see. But again, the game's on Peacock, man. We can't watch it in the quad box if we got YouTube TV. It's just horrible. All right, Cincinnati at Colorado in a battle for uh, you know two top dogs in the Big 12. Um, both five and two overall. Uh, of course, I'm rooting for the Bearcats. I always root for every Ohio team, regardless, particularly when they're playing Colorado. But just like I did last week, making some money off Colorado, I'm going to do it again. Colorado minus six and a half. They're going to cover that with ease. And these are our picks. UNLV plus three and a half. USC minus 13 and a half. Ohio State 
minus 25 and a half, Notre Dame minus 14, Indiana minus six and a half, Oregon minus 22, BYU plus two, Missouri plus 16 and a half, Vanderbilt plus 18 and a half, Texas A&M and a pick'em, Michigan State plus five, Kansas plus 10, Colorado minus six and a half, and we've got one more game. All right, we want to talk about rivals. We want to talk about, uh, talk about hate. Florida State heads into Miami, number six Miami, and Florida State has absolutely nothing to play for. They are a 21-point underdog, and they have got a bunch of guys on that team that seemingly don't give a damn about Florida State, about anything but themselves. They screwed up in the transfer portal this go-around. They did good in the last two, and this is what happens when you rely on the portal too much. And I think Mike Norvell has probably learned his lesson about that. However, if ever there was a time for a team playing for nothing, like this is all they got, man. They got no bull game. They got nothing. This is all they got. Are they going to make a game of it? And if they got one ounce of pride on that team, they're absolutely going to make a game of it. And I believe that they are. I think that uh, they're going to get in that 21. I'm going to guess this is going to be Miami minus uh, Miami win by 10 or or 14. Miami's not going to blow them out. They're not going to cover that 21. I believe in Norvell as a head coach. I think that he's made a mistake in the way he's constructed his roster. And I think that he's going to be able to get these guys up for one damn game, which is the only thing left for them to get up for. And they are going to play Miami tough. So, we're going to take Florida State plus that 21 and uh, cross our fingers, man. How about that? That is our bold play of the day. Um, Now, one more thing before we roll on out of here. I'm sure you've uh, all seen the James Franklin press conference. Uh, If you haven't, Basically, what happens is in August, a couple of Penn State players were not at practice and Penn State said they were dealing with personal issues, which it comes out Tuesday. They've been dismissed from the team for a while. It comes out Tuesday that both of these kids had been charged with rape while they were on the team. Now, being that it's Penn State and uh, there has been situations before at Penn State one would think that everybody would support the Penn State media trying to dig into exactly what happened. And seeing as James Franklin is the head football coach of Penn State and they were players on his team when it happened, of course, James Franklin's going to be asked questions about it. But before the press conference, after practice on uh, Wednesday, one of uh, the, the lackeys came out and read some generic three-sentence statement basically saying, Don't ask Coach Franklin about this. Now, as a reporter, your job is to work for the general public, uh, the supporters of the team, the public, for us. Uh, I say that a lot with Ohio State because I'm an Ohio State fan. Penn State fans should feel the same way. And if if you're a Penn State fan, you're going to want to know if their head coach has something to say about it. Well, The SID clearly said he wasn't going to say anything about it, but that doesn't matter, see, because what a reporter has to do, their job, like Journalism 101, is not just give him an opportunity to decline comment so that you can put in your story, we asked James Franklin, James Franklin declined. You don't put in your story, the SID said don't ask coach, so we didn't ask coach. You have to ask. It's part of your job. And they did. One gentleman asked, James Franklin walked off the stage. He came back. Now, Audrey Snyder then asked. Now, Audrey Snyder, one of the most respected journalists in college football, because she doesn't put up with any nonsense, which you know me. I rail against this nonsense and these reporters being chummy with the, with the programs that they work for so that they can get more access in the way this, this is all screwed up, the whole situation. Um, she doesn't do that. She does her job. She does a great job. And I wish she was on the Ohio State beat. She's fantastic. Anyway, she asks a second question. James Franklin walks off the stage again. So this goes viral. Everybody absolutely roasting the Penn State journalist or roasting James Franklin for being a petulant child and walking off the stage when all he needed to do was say, 
I have no comment. That's it. It's their job to ask. It's his job to say no comment. Now, maybe she shouldn't have asked a second question after he already refused comment, essentially, by walking off the stage, though he never actually refused comment. But it's their job to ask. And I have seen some things coming from some people that just have no understanding of how this works. Things like, they give you the opportunity to cover the team, and this is how you act. Totally misunderstanding the dynamic here. They're not giving an opportunity to to cover the team. That is our right to have media at the team as a public university. Those people are covering the team for the fans of Penn State. In Penn State, do they do do they gain advantage from that? Are do, have you ever looked at advertising prices? Those journalists built these these programs. Like word doesn't get out about these programs 150 years ago if it's not for journalists. Stories don't get written if it's not for journalists. This is why they want those journalists present so that they write stories, free advertisement for them everywhere. This is not about a privilege to cover the team. These are legitimate credentialed journalists doing their job. They're not looking for a moment. They're trying to get answers and do their job. And their job is journalism 101. You are to ask that man, these players on his team, why they were on his team are now on trial for rape. You're going to ask him if he has a comment about it, whether this little dork tells you he's not going to or not. It's your job. So y'all got this way twisted, man. Those people work for us. And most of the time they suck. And then they come and do their job like you would want them to do. And all of a sudden they're getting crap. Are you kidding me? I can't stand these people most of the time. I think 80% of them suck. I can give you on a list of, of five fingers, the biggest beat in the country, the Ohio State beat. There's but a few who are really good at their job, who would have done exactly what Audrey Snyder would have done, which is, I'm going to ask this uncomfortable question, whether your little lackey tells me to or not, because you're the $10 million a year coach who has two players on his team now on trial for rape. That's the job, dude. You don't walk off like a child. You say no comment like a man, like a grown-up, like an adult. And what you've got here is James Franklin turning into a real Kirk Ferentz where he's been at Penn State so long and got so much power there now that he's like the king of Penn State. And he ain't earned any king title, uh, in my opinion. But anyway, just wanted to say that about that. Uh, I understand that uh, reasonable people can disagree on this, as I've heard people I respect all over the place have the total opposite opinion that I got here. But I just... I think that if I was also talking to those people, they would also tell me that they agree with me that 90% of these journalists that cover the teams, the college football teams, want to be buddies with the organization. They want to be buddies with the coach. They want to be buddies with everybody so that they can get access so that the thing that they sell, which is information, is more valuable than the next guys because they now got themselves more access because they're buddies, right? They would agree with me on that. So you can't have it both ways. Then you, get a, then you get a real journalist, like the first gentleman who I don't know at Penn State, and Audrey Snyder, who asked the tough question to get him on record, which is their job, to get him on record. And he refused, by the way, to put himself on record by walking away. He did it intentionally. Um, you know, you can't have it both ways in, in anything. So props to Audrey Snyder and to him. Props to the people who understand that those people are working for us. And it's not a privilege for them to cover the team. It's our right to have them covering the team. Anyway, that's that. With that, you guys are awesome. I hope you have a tremendous weekend. I hope to see you Saturday night in a live show. Please like and subscribe to the show and the video. And check out my sponsor, Columbus Apparel Co. They're the official sponsor of Chuck on Bucks. They treat me good. They treat the community good. If you need anything printed, screen printing, check them out at columbusapparelco.com. You can also find any Chuck on Bucks merchandise you would like there, like this awesome Chuck Eyes tri-blend shirt that is so fantastically comfortable. 
um, and uh, a, a bevy of other things as well. And uh, drop me an email at juckonbucks uh, at gmail.com if you need to talk about anything. I appreciate you all so much. I'll see you soon. Juck on Bucks. Oh, juck, juck off. Hey, it's Juck. Juck. Who the f- is Juck? Juck on Bucks. Juck on Bucks. Juck on Bucks. Juck. 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 Juck on Bucks. My guy, Juck. Juck on Bucks. Juck. My buddy, Juck. Juck is Juck. The Juck. It's Juck on Bucks. Okay. Juck. Juck is the junk. The Juck eyes. The Juck eyes. Juck on Bucks. Junk. Junk. Not junk. Junk. Junk.